Hi everyone and welcome to the Smart Grid Heavy Hitter series here on Green Monk TV. My guest on the show today is Kevin Marr from EDSA. So Kevin, uh, we've, you've seen a couple of the videos so far and you, you're familiar with the format. Uh, we'll start off as, as, as we often do with what, what, do, what do you and what do EDSA define as a smart grid? Sure, my pleasure. Um, I would uh, uh, define the smart grid um, uh, in, certainly in terms of how we participate in it. Uh, as a segment of the of the smart grid that is typically referred to as the microgrid, um, and the microgrid is a segment that is uh, often associated with um, uh, multiple generation sources and essentially, uh, you know, as the name implies, a smaller than than a uh, than a larger grid. So a smaller collection of um, uh, area that it's managing. Sometimes as small as a building, uh, sometimes as large as a campus. Uh, and today, <clears throat> we are active participants. Uh, in a microgrid that's being installed at the University of California in San Diego, which is our really our first microgrid application, uh, and then our real market, where we spend most of our, our most of our systems are installed, are in data centers, which are uh, both large consumers of energy, but also have the um, the important and unique requirement for high availability and reliability. Okay, and what what's the importance of microgrids? Why are they important to the grid? I mean, what what do they? Wh why have microgrids at all? Well, there's a, it's a fairly controversial discussion area. There are lots of, um, depending on your perspective, whether you're more from the generation source or the user side of it, uh, but certainly um, it has uh, strong parallels with other distributed computing technologies um, and other distributed uh, infrastructure, such as uh, the most common one that people think of are the cellular phone industry. And um, uh, if you remember back when cellular phones were becoming more and more popular, uh, they originated by you had certain areas of coverage uh, or cells uh, which were very analogous to microgrids and the purpose for that uh, was to build out the infrastructure without impacting the major um, uh, telephony providers microgrids have the same basic characteristics uh, that they allow a user to operate multiple generation sources locally uh, and participate in the connection to the larger grid or not uh, depending on both um, performance and economic circumstances. The product that you guys are bringing to market, uh, if memory serves, it's Paladin Live Smart Grid is the name of it. Um, it this helps people do what with a, with a microgrid? Basically what uh, uh, Paladin Smart Grid does is it, um, we, there are three steps to the process. Um, we create a model, uh, a, a very exact model of all of the interconnections, if you will, of the power network, like everything that's associated with it. Uh, then we um, co co uh, collect the data, very granular data, on exactly um, in a real-time scenario what the network is doing, and we compare the model's uh, expectations to what the actual data says. And then we use that information to optimize the network and make recommendations. For example, if you're a user who has a diesel generation source, a utility, maybe uh, energy storage, What's the proper mix based on your requirements, your very specific requirements for load and availability versus cost? And it's uh, uh, that that what can can be a very complex um, equation, or um, in some cases, kind of classic uh, uh, um, competitive game theory, where you know sometimes having the lowest cost is not the most available. So what's the right mix that we would make recommend for you? Uh, and then on top of all that, we give users the ability to do what ifs from a very non-power perspective. What if I were to turn this off? What if I were to turn this on? What if I were to shut this down? Or what if something else happened? How would everything perform so they know what it will do before they do anything? That brings up an interesting question. Who, uh, who's your target customer for, for this product? Is it the utilities? Is it, is it customers, the data center owners you talk about? Or who? Um, in our case, uh, we target, uh, obviously, you, this is an interconnected grid network, uh, so there is a great, there's a strong association with all the utility companies and generation sources, but our target customers tend to be um, local operators of a, um, of a campus or a building. So it would be a data center operator, data center manager, for example. Um, in the case of the universities, it's the university environment. Um, and then other definitions include, of a microgrid include, um, uh, uh, smaller or large campuses, uh, which may be loosely connected or affiliated, or it may be a campus for a business. So 
um, very commercial um, in its um, in its focus uh, and very um, um, focused on the operation the operators of this of the local system as opposed to the the um, uh, larger grid. Do you see, for instance, maybe uh, several university campuses coming together, or maybe several data centers coming together and aggregating their supply and demand? Uh, if they put up generation as well as their own demand and maybe using your software or similar software uh, to buy and sell electricity, maybe even do energy arbitrage. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it's a natural evolution of um, what will happen, I'm sure. Um, I, we certainly are the, of the opinion that, uh, that the aspect of what the people refer to as the microgrid um, will have the most dramatic impact on, on the adoption of um, uh, or the quick adoption of uh, smart grid technologies for exactly that reason. There's strong economic incentive uh, for um, organizations like data centers first to participate as a, uh, as a microgrid, uh, but then also to um, form um, organizations that, that collectively work together that can do uh, the kind of arbitraging that, you know, that uh, is more common in the other, in the, in the more traditional um, grid environment, but now opens up entirely new areas. Um, so it's really it's. Um, I should mention, by the way, that there's uh, there's a um, a book was written by um, a couple of folks called Perfect Power. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Uh, the former uh, president of um, EPRI, Kurt Yeager, and a, and a gentleman from Motorola. And one of the points they make inside there is that regardless of your strategy, regardless of what you're trying to do, the availability of power is the number one concern. So whatever you do, if you expect to see it adopted, if you want to see significant growth, if you want to see things work the way you want to, you have to keep in mind that um, cost is really secondary. If you don't have power, it doesn't matter what it costs you. So it's that that mix of it, and that is particularly well suited to um, the economic model of people like your, your current your both data centers, universities, other large campuses or buildings, even industrial users, where um, the loss of power has significant impact on their ability to continue to do things. And I'm not denigrating the residential side, that certainly absolutely is, is important. But the early adopters, we believe, are certainly going to be in, the, uh, in this more industrial sector. What about, I mean, I think for, for a lot of this to proceed uh, with variability in, in supply, I think a, a significant barrier to that is going to be decent storage systems. Are you seeing any movement there? Um, you know, the, the, uh, historically, the storage systems... Um, have always had the the uh, all all of energy storage has had the had the problem that uh, traditional lead acid battery storage is just so economical uh, that it it uh, has been difficult for other technologies to be adopted. Uh, but the microgrid and the smart grid in general um, places new demands on energy storage that um, both the technologies and the availability of them and even the scaling of them. So something as simple as you know the lithium ion batteries in your in your phone or your laptop. Um, and how the the demand on those and the requirements for their energy storage have, have really started to change both the, you know the chemistry and the creativity. So there's a there's a phenomenal amount of um, uh, activity going on today on the uh, storage side that will have a dramatic impact both on residential and on commercial customers. And not just traditional chemistries like that, but you know ice storage, as you're probably aware of. And things. Are, are you seeing differences in different geographies around uh, uptake of microgrids? Uh, is it happening more in one place or another? Are there different incentives affecting it or different regulations affecting them? Um, certainly the, the yes, the short answer to that is yes. Um, uh, certainly um, um, the, the local energy cost and the level of deregulation of, of utilities um, or regulation of utilities has an impact on it. Um, Arguably, developing economies are much better candidates for microgrids because of the instability of power to begin with. Um, and um, uh, and uh, although that's not where the early adopters are coming from, that certainly the incentives that the U.S. government has provided has been a great motivator uh, to get things moving faster here. Um, and then, as I mentioned, uh, we certainly believe that that the data center community is an extremely well-suited uh, target for data centers because they've already got the infrastructure. They have. 90% of what they want. Uh, they're just more accustomed to thinking of generation as emergency generation rather than continuous generation. So with a very minor shift in approach, it becomes probably the most powerful economic model um, uh, of, of the um, uh, opportunities associated with the microgrid or a smart grid. Cool. Kevin, thanks a million for coming on the show.